So we are now live, both on Facebook and here on Zoom, getting folks trickling in here to the fifth episode of Startup Showdown. In just a minute, I'll stop screen sharing, let everyone see our nicely designed intro slide here, and we'll get into what is sure to be another exciting episode. Uh, by, by the way, Jasmine, I really like yeah. all the new, uh, I like all the new um, uh, colors and, and designs and, and logo and so on. Very good. Oh, thank you. It's been a lot of fun rebranding. You know, as an organization, a lot has changed lately. You know, I'm new to the organization, so is Chris. Like, a lot has, a lot has changed. A lot has been sort of improved upon. So it's nice to, to do that kind of forward facing as well, like, to the rest of the world. But I'm glad you like it, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we are getting folks trickling in. I'm going to get things started because as those of you who have been to this show before, it is on a tight schedule. Today, we are on episode five of Startup Showdown, focused on health tech. Here with me today, we have three incredible investors and three extremely innovative startups who are going to be pitching you all. I encourage, like always, for those in the audience to use the Q&A to ask questions to each of these founders. As the host, I'm going to be moderating them, keeping an eye on them, and the ones that make sense that perhaps our investors haven't gotten into, uh, I'll ask as well, so we can make sure that your voices are heard too. For any of you that are interested in saying hello, just sharing whatever news you've got going on, saying how much you love the new Tech United brand, go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, and we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. And that's a great place for you all to network. Um, as a quick housekeeping note, this is being recorded. It'll be available on the Tech United NJ website over the next day or two. So in case you wanna catch up, share it with a friend, it'll be live on there. Um, without further ado, just wanna say hello. I'm the head of experience at Tech United. My name is Jasmine, I'll be your host for today. And let me have each of our three investors joining us introduce themselves. The startups are going to have plenty of time in just a few minutes. Um, but Dean, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jasmine. My name is Dean Dreisen. I'm a senior associate at Touchdown Ventures, uh, where we partner with large corporations to help them establish and then run their corporate venture capital programs. I joined Touchdown in June of 2019. And prior to that, I was an active duty physician in the Navy. Uh, working as a flight surgeon. So I was the primary care physician for Navy pilots and their supporting air crew. And I still do practice uh, in a reserve capacity with a squadron now in the Navy Reserve. Um, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Touchdown. And I look forward to the pitches. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. And happy one year anniversary at Touchdown. <laughs> thank you. Of course. Next, we've got Sandra, who is graciously joining us today. You want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, Sandra, you cut out there. Not first. only healthcare providers in the state of New Jersey, but we are also looking to um, increase our ability to transform healthcare through innovative startups. Happy to, to be here, and hopefully, there's an opportunity to uh, have some further discussion as well. So uh, we look forward to it. Awesome, thank you very much. And Mark, people probably know who you are. I know this is not your first time joining Startup Showdown, but why don't you say hello? Oh, well, fine, thanks very much. <laughs> My name is Mark Kolb. I'm a partner with the Tech Council Ventures. Uh, we're a New Jersey-based uh, early stage uh, venture fund. Uh, my background is really that of an entrepreneur, entrepreneur turned venture capitalist. And I've got two partners, uh, Jim and Steve, who are 20 year plus uh, VCs, real smart, fabulous guys. Um, we are, um, I would say, uh, early stage technology investors. We invest in the mid-Atlantic, pretty technology agnostic, although we'll do a lot of uh, healthcare IT, some clean tech, some, some materials, some enterprise tech. Um, and we're just looking for great entrepreneurs and, and, and terrific companies and, and glad to be here, Jasmine. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for joining us. Um, as you all might be seeing, those of you that are, that are tuning in, you're also seeing notices in the chat from Jane and from Anna, who are part of the, the Tech United and the Tech Council Ventures team. So if you see them sharing helpful information or links, 
definitely keep an eye out for the messages from them. We couldn't do these programs without the support of the rest of our team. So if you see something from them, keep an eye on it. Jane and Anna are always available to anyone here has questions about how they can get more involved with either of our organizations. Um, and more information about all of these companies, including the investors and the startups, can be found on our Tech United Startup Showdown website. So again, for those of you that are just tuning in, we're about to get into the startup pitches. Please put any questions you have for the founders in the chat and the Q&A, and I'll keep an eye on those. And we are going to get right into it with our first pitch of the day, Neomis. Sunshine, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Well, I just click the share screen? Yep. Okay. Go right ahead. I'm going to stop my video. When you see me pop up, that's when you know you have a 30-second warning for your five minutes. So do I have the screen now? Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity, uh, invitation and the opportunity introducing the Omix. Uh, we are the company uh, using the cutting edge uh, Neomix, uh, genomics approach to discover and develop immunotherapy to treat major disease like cancer. It's not a ruling. This slide is not ruling. You may need to just scroll. Oh, okay. So we're based, uh, I'm actually living in uh, New Jersey. I'm New Jersey, but uh, my company is based in the uh, uh, by incubator at Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, we have an experienced uh, uh, seasoned uh, uh, biotech entrepreneur. Uh, personally, this is a very exciting year for myself uh, as uh, three of uh, 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 drug candidates, I work on the previous startups entering the clinical trial. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Jack Lieberman, uh, who is a former veteran, uh, advise us on the uh, late stage preclinical development regulatory uh, early stage of clinical development. And we'll also work with uh, Dr. Maoxin Duan, uh, who used to be a uh, chief scientist at the GSK. Uh, and uh, on the uh, drug uh, project uh, for coronavirus. So, uh, when you, so you, when you look at all the uh, major disease, you all, always find a common th a theme behind them, uh, the uh, adaptive immunity. That's the scientific term for the T and the D lymphocytes. Uh, they, you can find them in uh, uh, COVID-19. There, they could be uh, actually treatment for this disease. You could find them in a uh, disease environment in the tumor. They also are very effective treatment for tumor, but they can be also a cause for the disease. So you, you, when you look at the, uh, the neuron degeneration disease like Alzheimer, Parkinson's, you can find the most uh, 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 lymphocytes in those uh, disease environment actually cause the autoimmune uh, inflammation. But they are very extremely complex to uh, decommodal from disease. So at the Neonics, we develop an internal uh, core technology platform based on uh, contemporary genomics uh, approach. So we now can actually decouple uh, the, the antibody from B lymphocytes or TCR from T cells from those uh, disease microenvironments at unprecedented uh, pre resolution and efficiency. So with this technology, it opens the uh, uh, completely novel uh, tech, uh, drug discovery platform. So we can more efficiently develop antibody drugs and uh, vaccines. We can also develop a TCR based drugs for cell therapy, proteins, chemicals, and gene therapy. And this uh, immunotherapy, novel immunotherapy pipeline can treat disease like cancer, infectious, and autoimmune disease. So currently, uh, we have four pipelines. Uh, three of them are T-cell, T-cell-based uh, therapy to treat solid tumors. And we also work on a drug discovery uh, for the coronavirus. 
So those projects uh, will enter the clinical investment uh, in next few years and will bring uh, very innovative uh, treatment approaches for solid tumors. So the next big wave in cancer treatment, obviously it's a, a immunotherapy and immunotherapy for solid tumors. Uh, early this year, Nature Biotech named the LAIR uh, Immunopharma, who is, uh, the company is funded by former uh, NCI director, Dr. Richard Kloster, to tackle the uh, solid tumor treat, uh, treatment by T cell therapy. And uh, in February, we also see a publication from uh, a pioneer in this field from Dr. Kajun at UPenn to develop the uh, TCRT therapy for solid tumors. Uh, but as of now, uh, those leading players in the field, uh, the approach is still experimental as Dr. Kajun uh, said on his own work, he thinks that uh, remains like 10 years from now for this kind of approach to enter clinicals. But here we think we have the te technology to address this unmet clinical uh, problems right away. So we're gonna bring uh, experimental to the clinic in the next few years. So for this, I will conclude my uh, presentation here. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, if you wanna go ahead, you can stop screen sharing and we'll get right into the investor feedback. All right, we're gonna kick things off with Dean. What's your feedback? Yeah, first, thanks so much. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and what motivated you to, to focus now on neomics. Okay. And this core technology uh, in particular. Yeah, uh, I used to work uh, in industry uh, as an oncology drug, uh, drug discovery scientist. And the uh, last 10, 10 years, I uh, started as an entrepreneur and uh, work on a mo uh, several pro uh, startups. Uh, as I was said in the beginning, three of my drug candidates entering clinical trials this year. And uh, this company uh, was actually, uh, we started operation uh, November, uh, November last year, but actually I uh, literally spent two and a half years to conceive this company. Uh, what the big question we're facing and what the, you know, the best uh, solution to address them. I see, thank you. And, and um, how are you funded to date? Uh, we were, uh, I raised uh, 1.5 million uh, uh, from angel investor. And do you anticipate that um, covering you uh, for how long uh, in the pipeline? Um, another one and a half year. Thank you. All right, thank you. Sandra, your feedback and questions? Yeah, just a couple of quick questions as it relates to kind of your next steps. I mean, what are, what's your goal for the next, you know, three, six, nine months as it becomes um, to take the technology to the next level? Okay. Uh, and per, and per the, right. What funding needs you have? Yes. Uh, the for last six months, we kind of like uh, uh, develop all this uh, technology platform uh, as of today, uh, we have made uh, significant progress and uh, we, we think we have a prototype technology platform out there for us to work. Uh, with that, we're working on two animal models. One is a melanoma mouse model, one is a colon uh, cancer mouse model. So we demonstrate that the TCRT uh, technology, the, uh, you know, uh, I said, it with, was leading the wave of the leaders, we demonstrate in, demonstrate in these two mouse models. So we anticipate to have a uh, first batch of data, significant batch of data in vivo efficacy evidence in six, nine months. And just one more uh, quick question around that. What, what IP do you already have? You know, what, what does the organization Neomics have from an intellectual property standpoint? Uh, we, 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 we don't have the IP, uh, that's why we raised the angel invest, investment. Uh, but with the current uh, the data we have, uh, we anticipate the filing 
um, couple uh, call IPs uh, in the second half of the year. Okay. All right, that's all I have. Excellent, thank you. Mark? Mark, you're muted. Thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, so, so first of all, thank you very much. That, that a, a terrific presentation. I mean, a really important space and we all understand that. So uh, I, I, I appreciate the energy you're putting into that. Thank you. Um, you say you've raised a million and a half so far to get to where you are. Tell us a little bit about sort of the, the, the business model going forward. What kind of capital you anticipate you'll raise? Um, who, who are your logical partners? And, 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 and then what is, what, yeah, talk a little bit about the, the, the business model and the partners and capital raise going forward. Okay. So we, we are uh, looking for a seed, seed investment of uh, somewhere around like a 3 million to expand the team and the generate the uh, uh, extensive data. And with that, uh, we look, uh, we think we uh, look for early uh, development partnership with a big farmer. Um, so in next, <coughs> you know, uh, one, around like one year. Um, so we anticipate enter clinical development in somewhere one to two years for the, uh, our first two pipelines, uh, which one is a personalized TCLT therapy. Another one is a uh, very novel, uh, invariant TCLT based. Okay. Is that ambitious? That's, that sounds like that might be, be pretty, uh, pretty Yes, it's, a, it's ambitious, but uh, <laughs> we think there's a chance to at least to take one. Uh, uh, okay, I, what I anticipate, the evidence we can demonstrate in the two animal models, it will be eye popping. Uh, that was uh, never seen this kind of uh, T-cell based therapy for solid tumors, any kind of. Okay. There's never such a publication in the literature people can do as well in uh, clinic, but it based on uh, what we have learned from CAR T, PD-1, those big immunotherapies, I think we're ready for that. Okay, and, and, and if you can be successful there, you, you, I think you have genuine IP, uh, so, so good. For Absolutely, you. Uh, yeah. you know, that's, this company was actually founded based on my concepts, not okay. based on, uh, the data and evidence for IP. Okay. So sure. now we're ready for that. Yeah, we're, we're doing that for, for that stage. Just, just two quick questions then. Um, who would be the logical partner? You know, what, what type, which pharmas would be Merck, Novartis, uh, the biggest uh, uh, immunotherapy players um, for the antibodies are Merck and the BMS. Okay. And the biggest uh, cell therapy are the Gilead, and then Novartis. Yep, yep, of course. And how, let me just ask you one last question. How early would you anticipate trying to exit? How far would you expect uh, to go in the process before you try and? Uh, that depends on the business model. Uh, you know, how much, uh, how you collab, uh, definitely we are looking for early stage um, partnership with uh, those big farmers. Uh, then that will depend on the, what kind of collaboration are they, you know, play the major role or we play the co-development roles? Of course. All right. Yes. Great. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jasmine. Definitely. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I do just have a couple more questions from the audience here. And, and quite naturally, there were a few people that honed in on your mention of, of COVID in your presentation. So is there any potential strategy or plan in place to focus in the near term? Uh, yes. on COVID? We, are, we are looking for very near term momentum. Uh, uh, this is very early. You know, I, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this one because we are doing a small molecule drug discovery 
uh, based on very innovative design. So we, we're we gonna test the next week uh, a battery for seven compounds based on the design. If it works, we're gonna have a, a, you know, a property. If it doesn't work, we just take like a $15,000 company in there, here. But I think it was it. So if it works, uh, the the our goal actually is to take a, a you know a compound position IP, and we collaborate with the government. So we collab we seeking collaboration with the NCAS NIH institutes to firstly develop this compound. Uh, this is a, uh, and the compound we develop is targeting on the proteins. Okay, the COVID-19 main protein. Uh, and this is actually very nice mechanism wise, a combination probably for, uh, with that uh, uh, drug from uh, Gilead. That's what we think. Okay, very interesting. So, so did I hear you right that this is something that you're doing next week? Like next week's next week? Like yes. June? No, next week. Wow. Okay. I mean, that seems like a, a big deal. I mean, I, I'm uh, not. No, no, we, first, you know, I, I don't want to jump yet. You know, West, we, we have a, a 12 compound design uh, that's very inno innovative for uh, how we actually targeted the, uh, the, the produce. But yeah. whether we have a project or dep depends on whether this design is right or not. So, Okay. Well, let's see if we can get the positive <laughs> from that right. answer. If we get the hit, you know, definitely I think we'll have a project. If we're not, you know, we'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so I have the benefit of, I looked over your slides in advance. And so I, you know, I've been looking through some of the questions you've gotten from our audience, but I want to hone in on the actual, a little bit of the science of it. So are you utilizing like the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to identify the T cells and that's how you're going in and identifying the proteins or is there another this, type of technology? This is just a part of our toolbox. Got it, okay. Yeah, we use a variety of uh, genetics uh, and the genomics uh, approach. Okay. So the long term, that's why you see actually the vision, we, uh, the mission we put for our company is in the long run. Hmm. It's, uh, uh, I think uh, like particularly like, particularly like a TCR-based uh, drug discovery. Yeah. No such uh, drug class for the pharma industry. So we want to bring a very innovative uh, approach for the entire industry. Okay, excellent. Um, any other comments from the investors before we go on to the next pitch? We ready to rock and roll? All right, well, thank you so much for answering our questions. Best of luck on this trial next week. We're gonna bring you back on at the end for our closing remarks. But for now, we're going to bring on Jennifer from Navamize to present her pitch. Thank you very much. Okay, hi everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's see, can everyone see my screen now? Yep. All right, I'll get started. Perfect. So hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jennifer Meller. I'm the CEO and founder of Navamize, and Navamize features a virtual waiting room platform. So pre-COVID, Navamize was really all about reducing wait times to maximize patient satisfaction. And um, when COVID hit, we pretty quickly pivoted from what we now view was a nice to have patient satisfaction platform to a must have patient safety platform. As health systems are seeking to reopen, they're now faced with all of these new regulatory guidelines around social distancing, and they lack the tools to efficiently address uh, these guidelines. Uh, what we've also seen is a rapid shift to telemedicine. Um, but patients are, what we found is that patients are having a lot of trouble getting online, a lot of patients log in, and then there's no communication, so they drop off. So the scramble has been to respond to this by uh, pulling in um, front, office, front office staff to manually call the patients to manage their arrival times, tell them exactly when they should be arriving at the office. Um, and this is really doesn't, barely works at low volumes that we have now and is unsustainable as we get to larger and larger volumes of in-person visits. Um, they're also having front office staff make manual calls to make sure that patients don't drop off from telemedicine visits. 
So Natomy solves this problem by automating real-time communication with patients. We're able to predict delays in the schedule and text patients exactly when it's their turn to arrive at the office. And in this way, we're able to really streamline flow. We're also able to text patients and support telemedicine to give them instructions about logging on and also to make sure that they remain online even if the doctor's running behind. This is a look at the user interface. I just want to point out here that we integrate with EMRs to provide a turnkey solution. This is the patient side, the patient experience. They receive the text message. There's no app to download. Here's a look at some sample text messages, both for in-person visits and telemedicine visits. And a little bit about the team. Um, again, I mentioned I'm a physician. I've been in practice a long time. I'm a primary care physician. My office is in New York City. Um, my co-founder, Kavita Mongol, her background is in tech. She's an engineer by training. And she, um, sorry, my fax machine is doing something funny in the background. She's an engineer by training, spent 10 years at EY, uh, essentially implementing technology solutions for FinTech. And then spent a year and a half at Mount Sinai uh, in the genetics department and finance operations and bringing in new technologies. This is a look at the market size. Again, this is healthcare, so always a large market size. Um, this is a look at our traction. So we've signed a contract with LifePoint Health. Um, I want to point out that actually in the couple of days since we sent over this slide, we've had some updates. Jefferson has now signed a contract uh, to begin piloting in their ENT department. We're close to signing with UH and LifeBridge has moved up here to asking for a pilot. And with UMichigan, we're also uh, in the process of applying for an SBI or grant together. So a lot of activity, a ton of traction all in the last four to six weeks, seeing huge inbound demand for our platform. The business strategy is really to take these one to three new contracts, deliver on them, and then build and scale from there. And here's our strategy for doing so. So we're focusing on states with robust reopening plans, um, looking to access through our, our current channel partnerships, creating buzz through webinars, uh, creating a lot of inbound interest is what we're aiming for, and then following that up with uh, direct follow-up. This is the business model. So we're a SaaS platform, we sell uh, per provider on a per provider per month basis. We also have a per visit option for enterprise systems. So a couple words about competition. I'm going to focus on queue management companies. These are companies like QLess, Solve, uh, IQ. All of these companies manage queues but focus just on urgent care. And the reason they do that is in urgent care, there's a very linear flow. That does not apply in doctor's offices. And we've been able to make uh, sense out of all the chaos that occurs uh, in different doctor's offices. No matter what the patient flow, we're able to manage that, predict delays, and text and pe message patients in real time. I actually think we need to add a column. I've been, I've been thinking the last couple of days, we need to add a column here for companies like Freesia and Otec and Yossi, who were not our competitors before, but now are positioning themselves as virtual waiting rooms. And I'll point out that while they position themselves that way, they really bring um, check-in from a manual paper check-in to a uh, virtual check-in, a mobile check-in, but don't do anything in the realm of queue management or wait time management, which is where we differentiate. This is our raise. We're actually extending the raise to 500 cakes. We've raised uh, close to 300 very quickly in the last few weeks. Um, and here's where the money will go. Essentially, uh, it will go towards uh, hiring out engineering team, customer support, and eventually hiring um, a sales team as well. And with that, I'll pause and open the floor to questions. That was beautiful timing. <laughs> Five minutes on the dot. Okay. Might be an episode first. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm going to start again with feedback from Dean. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And no surprise if she manages waiting room time. So I mean, <laughs> Very uh, on brand. Yeah. And, and congratulations uh, both on the recent traction and on, on the recent raise and the continued raise. Um, Thank you. A lot of exciting developments here, I think, given what's going on. And um, one, I mean, just to dive right into the deck, one thing I found particularly interesting was the slide you showed on the text messages that go to patients. Are you providing instructions on new safety parameters or is that white label for the, for the providers or do the providers provide you with that content? Yeah, so that we, when we built the platform, we built it so that the messaging was fully customizable. Really down, most practices will decide, okay, at this site or this location, we're gonna keep the messaging uniform, but you can actually adjust the messaging down to the individual provider. 
So we're working with each of our customers in each of these sites to understand what their needs are. Do you want to convey the new policies? Do you want to just give patients a heads up, you know, 45 minutes before saying, come in your car and wait in your car and we'll text you when it's your turn to come in. So it really, depending on the needs of the health system, we can uh, uh, adjust that messaging to meet their needs. Got it. Um, another question I had um, was um, with respect to, um, forgive me, uh, just um, how, uh, I'm sorry, I just completely blanked. Um, <laughs> but <That> um, <laughs> Glad I'm not alone. <laughs> um, I'm curious, um, well, Sandra, can you take the next question and come back to me for one moment? Yeah, you're on mute, Sandra. So yes, I can take that if I can find the unmute button. <laughs> so a nice presentation, very well done. I was trying to take notes and you were going faster than I could take notes. So, um, but a couple of quick questions actually. One is, um, where are you getting the data feeds? Talk a little bit about the, the technology stack, where the information is coming from and um, any uh, platforms you've integrated with already from a physician practice standpoint or even from an enterprise uh, standpoint? Yes, sure, absolutely. So the, the data feeds, um, there's certain information that we take from the practice at the time of onboarding. So we need to understand a little bit about their flow and there's a list of a couple of questions we ask them gather that information, it's static information we enter it into the system. Then the dynamic data that we get is every day we pull the schedule for the day as, as changes occur to the schedule, we're constantly updating. I think it's like every 30 seconds that the platform is cycling and updating the information. And we're also pulling tracking data. So as the patient's journey through the office, there are clicks that naturally occur in the EMR when they arrive, when they go into an exam room, when they're done. We're pulling all those clicks. They're getting entered into our, our system and our, our algorithms crunch all of this data in order to be able to predict, okay, it's, you know, you have a 1 p.m. appointment. It's now 1230. We're about 20 minutes behind, we're going to tell you to come at 120. And then maybe at five to one, we'll tell you, okay, we're actually 23 minutes behind, you know, or 25 minutes behind, head upstairs at 125. That, that's how that uh, occurs. And in terms of uh, data integrations, we're fully integrated with Athena. So, uh, and we're in the market, we have customers, Athena customers using the platform. Um, we're rolling out to LifePoint. They have about a thousand providers on Athena. So we're beginning that rollout with them. And we are actually um, working with um, a couple of these other health systems. We're working with UH to look at a Cerner integration. Um, Epic is another big, uh, you know, the big player in the space. And so we've, what we've done with Epic is we've spoken to Redox and the first health system that wants to come on board with Epic, I think we're going to do through, uh, if the health system, especially if the health system wants it this way, we'll probably attack that through a Redox integration. So have the Redox integration, then just have Redox plug right into Epic since they've done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these. They have the process down. It's very smooth and do that way. The other thing about the integration is today we're only pulling information one direction. So we're read only. We're not writing back to the EMR. <laughs> And the information we're taking is just all around scheduling and tracking. So not a lot of deep data on patient records and ICD codes, not a lot of interpretation that needs to be done there. So it's pretty straightforward from a technical perspective. And what, what kind of um, management reports, either a dashboard on an ongoing basis or even reports on the overall work queue and how that's being progressed as compared to schedule time, Mm -hmm. um, let's say all of a sudden I know on a particular day I'm down to staff. I want to be able to see on a routine basis how far I'm getting, you know, how, how far behind are we or, you know, so I just really want to understand because obviously, you know, there's a patient experience opportunity here, mm -hmm. um, but there's also a workflow management opportunity. And so I'm very interested to, to kind of understand a little bit more about what you guys are focusing in on there. I know you're focusing on really just getting it out there at this point, but um, talk a little bit about what you see as the future of the, the capability that you can bring to the table. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually have had some deep discussions about this, about exactly what should be included in that dashboard. What is it that the health systems want to see? What is this? What are the right parameters to put into that dashboard? Today, we pull the information. We run the metrics uh, manually and we have meetings with our practices and our customers to kind of feed back to them. Here's what it looks like. Here's what your wait times are. Here's your average wait time by physician. Here's the average appointment length by physician. So as we 
deploy to uh, LifePoint and to these other health systems, one of the things we're specifically looking at and working on is understanding what's the information that's important to you. We, we have our ideas about what data points are important, but tell us, give us feedback. What are the data points that you want to see? You know, as you mentioned, understanding, okay, if I have two less staff today, what does that do to my wait time? Like, what, what are those important data points? And then building that into a dashboard that would be easily accessible to the user. So that's a work in progress, but definitely absolutely 100% on our roadmap. So outside of the million that you're trying to raise right now, what do you see as your next, um, next timing for uh, raise and, and also the size of that raise? Because what you're talking about is really going to be a scaling challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So we see 12 to 18 months as the next, the next kind of point in time to raise. Um, it might be sooner if we start scaling more rapidly. We might want to raise that money sooner to expand faster. Uh, you know, time will tell. Um, I think the next round will be more of like a formal seed round. So closer to, to some, you know, anywhere from two to three, I think I, the upper limit would probably be five million, but probably somewhere in that range. All right. Dean, it looks like you thought of what your question was. Thanks so much, Sandra. Because I also was curious about EHR integration, which you covered. The other piece I was interested in was the patient demographics. Um, I saw in your slides you mentioned radiology and ENT. Um, you know, given the COVID landscape and the concern with entering into health systems, I'm curious if you've had any traction to date with pediatrics or adolescents. Yeah, yeah. So, so the way the idea came to me actually to pivot this, the, the platform from this patient's, you know, patient satisfaction to more of a patient safety platform was really because of my own experience. So my daughter had an appointment at the pediatrician for her annual checkup and I moved the appointment. And when I called, I said, you know, are you guys still seeing patients in person? And they said, yeah, listen, your daughter's 12. She can wait. She can get her vaccines in a month or two, but there are babies who need to come in and they need their vaccine. Scenes. And we are still seeing these patients in person. And that's when I started thinking about that as we reopen. And, and I, I, I asked them what their process was. And they were making all of these manual phone calls. So yes, we've seen a lot of interest from um, pu putting this out there for PCPs, putting this out there for pediatrics. But truthfully, as we reopen, we're seeing an interest in, in deploying this across the board. Because the, the challenge is becoming that as, as they reopen, they're putting all these people on the phone calling patients. It's not sustainable. I mean, I know this from my own office. It's sustainable with a small volume. It becomes impossible when you just, the volume visits go up. So, and it clogs up the phones and then patients can't call to like schedule appointments. So it really affects the ability to expand your visit volume if, if, if the staff are on the phone all day. Thanks so much. All right, all right excellent. And Mark. Okay, great. Thanks, Jennifer. So uh, full disclosure, uh, I, I know Jennifer, she and I've talked a couple times in the past and, and I like her business a lot. Um, and I also, I, I like the whole uh, pivot. I think that's really smart, all things considered. It, it makes perfect sense. So, so good for you. Well done. Um, and you're making, uh, Athena, as far as EHR integration, Athena Health, obviously, a real important place to be given, given the, the, the deals you're going after. Uh, I do think if you're going to go to Epic, the, 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 the Redox um, integration makes good sense. So, and, and we know those people there well, too. So if you, if, if you help, need help there, I'm, I'm glad to, to talk to them. Um, so right now, uh, you're, the EHR interface, you're getting data out of the, interface, uh, out of the EHR, you know, but you're not putting anything back into it. For example, changing schedules or something like that. Do you anticipate, is that sort of part of the future? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, so the vision, and I would say this was sort of our vision pre-COVID, was to create an intelligent scheduling platform ultimately. So here we are integrating. We're you know, bringing transparency and communication to wait times. Now we're helping keeping offices safe and expanding their visit volume by communicating and making sure the patients are streamlined through the office. But the goal ultimately was always to collect data and to understand who are these patients, what drives appointment length? I know from my own office, I could walk out into my waiting room and see an 85-year-old man who had Parkinson's, uh, multiple medications, walking with a walker, and sitting next to him could be a 20-year-old who needed a form filled out. And when they call my office to schedule a follow-up, they're both stuck into the same you know, 15 or 20-minute slot, which makes no sense. That's also exacerbated today by all these centralized call centers or online scheduling. Nobody knows who these patients are. It's not the old days where the secretary knew, oh, Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so is coming in. I know how much time to allot them. It doesn't exist. 
So our idea was to pull data, understand who are these patients, what drives appointment length, is it ICD codes, is it age, et cetera, and then build out a platform that at the time that the patients are scheduling, they get scheduled for the right amount of time and also at the right time. So someone who needs more time, maybe we schedule them on a lighter day of the week. Someone who's a quicker visit could be packed in on a busier day. So that was kind of the big vision. I, I think um, there's still an opportunity to get there. Um, and to do a lot of interesting things. I think the immediate need today is gonna be on, on very um, practical solutions that solve problems today, at least for the next 12 months as, as COVID stays with us. But certainly we still have our eye on that sort of big vision of creating intelligent scheduling, improving efficiencies while also improving the patient experience. Okay, Ma makes perfect sense to me. And, and uh... I don't want to ask about specific numbers. We've got a lot of people on here, but just what do you think a given, um, uh, what, what should a given contract be worth to you? Uh, 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 some of the types of, you know, on, on average, rough size. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna, so the LifePoint contract for the thousand Athena providers, um, we priced, you know, we, we gave them a sliding scale. So for a smaller group, less than 50 providers, we priced at 149 per provider per month. When you get up to a thousand providers, we scale it down and we have it at $49 per provider per month. So that's about a 600K ARR for those thousand providers. Um, now, interestingly, they also have a thousand providers on ECW. And one of the things they want to do is as the Athena rollout begins, they want to start talking to us about an ECW integration to roll it out to their thousand ECW providers. So that would double the size of that contract. So I would say if you're looking at a health system with 1,500 to 2,000 providers, you're looking at about a million in ARR. Good for you. Fabulous. All right. Uh, enough for me for now, Jasmine. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, you always have the best questions. Please. Uh, you, go all, you could do this all day. Um, but I, I do, I did get quite a few questions from the audience. Some of them, just so everyone knows, I'm going to save and I might send a few over your way, Jennifer, or let you know if there's anything that can't be solved just by heading over to your website and learning a little bit more. I do love all the folks in the chat that are calling you Dr. Jennifer. I really oh. have been <laughs> loving that. Um, but there's one that, that really stuck out, which is, you know, what, if any, opportunities are there for the patients to give feedback and input, such as confirming that they are still planning to arrive, and what are your plans in the pilots to gain feedback from providers and patients, perhaps post-visit, and that's from Kristen. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, so in terms of, um, like, sending back confirmations or texting back, I'm just making a note so I don't forget the second part of the question. Um, we've thought about that and we've actually asked our customers as we've started to, to roll out. And you know, it, it, they were like, oh yeah, I'd really love for the patients to be able to write back. And then when we asked the question, who's gonna receive those texts? Who's gonna be in charge of those texts? We sort of get a, oh, well, not sure, not sure. So I think there's definitely gonna be a role, a, a, an opportunity to do that and to get yeah. into a little bit of that bi-directional texting. We yeah. wanna be careful to do it in a way that doesn't create extra work for the practice. So do it in right. a way where maybe we're just doing confirmations or we're directing them. We, ha we have the ability to embed links so we can direct them to like the portal or to the website to get questions answered. So we're trying to figure out, again, as we roll out, I think that brings us to the second part of the question where we are setting up, you know, part of our contract with LifePoint, we said to them, listen, we want to set up regular meetings, get feedback as you're using yeah. this and rolling out and understand what do you like about this and what do you wish this had? Like, what else do you wish this platform had? Like, right. you know, is it these, you know, back-to-back -back confirmations? Is it a dashboard? What's most important? Um, so yes, we are setting up a schedule to get that kind of feedback. Um, can you repeat the second part of the question? Is there anything there that I missed? Or? Oh, I think you basically, I think you got everything. I think it was just about feedback and input. I, I think what you just said makes a lot of sense, even if it's just confirm type Y for yes and for no, like those little right. things, I'm sure are like easier to implement than, hey, like something happened and I broke my wrist, I need my right. annual checkup to be, you know, a cast. But, you know, I think there's probably baby steps there to implementing that. And I think there's probably opportunities, and I don't know if you've thought about this, to utilize some forms of like AI and chatbots to kind of oh, mitigate yeah. Yeah. some of that. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Thank you very much. I'll be bringing you on back on for closing remarks and for the audience choice poll. But for now, we're gonna bring on our final presentation of the day, which is Radha Zippy Care. Thank you. Radha, you've got five minutes whenever you're ready. Uh, let me just share my screen. Perfect, uh, thank you. Um, can you see it? 
Yeah, perfect. Hello from CityCare. I'm Dr. Ada Sumariva. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of uh, CityCare. And uh, I feel a lot of what I'm going to say is very much in sync uh, with uh, what Jennifer just discussed. So thanks, Jennifer, for setting up a stage for this discussion. Uh, we are the company that uh, uh, stands behind REAL as remote exam and allocation telemedicine powered by REAL intelligence. And this is our multi-talented team. Uh, collaboratively, we saved hundreds uh, of lives. We have hundreds of years of expertise in clinical practice, engineering, and digital health. We have two successful exits. We have uh, we founded 10 companies. I wish I had more time to go through each individual story, as I can promise to you, all of them, all of them are very unique and inspiring. So quick reference to the problem that we are trying to solve. Um, uh, CDC data shows that out of 137 million uh, annual ER visits, 85% of patients are self-transported, which means they come by foot. 68% or two thirds of them, are, uh, spent, after spending a few hours in the emergency room, actually leave with only one or two simple procedures done and with at most one uh, prescription referred to their um, primary care providers or other physicians. So we figured out that with our ZF care technology, uh, we can address 25% of all diagnosis presented. Also, out of what we can address, 80% of this diagnosis cannot, are not addressable by pure telemedicine platforms. So what is it that we do that is different? Uh, um, our um, elevated pitches, we are bringing house, call back, uh, house calls back in 21st century style. ZP is the next generation uh, in digital healthcare, uh, providing remote diagnosis at home via innovative technology solution to logistical problem. Basically, we are building the bridge between telemedicine and an in-person exam. Uh, well, there is an abundance of uh, telemedicine platforms on the market because digital health is a fast emerging field. Uh, we are bringing something completely new to the table, enabling our physicians to conduct remote physical exams and obtain some objective data through the exams, thus making conscientious diagnosis and expand on their diagnostic uh, capability. Also, there is a social component of no patient left behind um, uh, about our technology. If you think about all of these elderly people or um, disabled people or socio socioeconomically disadvantaged people who have no access to expensive technology, with our model, they can benefit from the cutting edge technology with no need to own this expensive technology and no need uh, to have skills to operate it. So just to walk you through, to give you a flavor of uh, what ZIF experience uh, looks like, um, uh, this is the ultimate technology experience. And of course, uh, for some groups of people, we have to modify it with a phone call uh, made appointment, but the ultimate technology experience looks just like that. You download the app on your smartphone, you uh, book a ZIF appointment, you put the symptoms, and we have, uh, uh, with help of our uh, proprietary um, decision tree algorithm, we are able to rule out all the acute emergencies, keeping our patients safe. Um, uh, once we, uh, once our system approves that this is the problem we can help with, the on-site care coordinator is being dispatched to the patient site. And as soon as in 45 minutes, you can get this on-site care coordinator knocking on your door. They will bring our proprietary toolbox with them. They will open it. And from then on, they'll basically uh, become an extension of physician's arm. They would apply stethoscope to your chest and the physician would listen to your heart and lung sound. They would uh, um, use our proprietary camera and the physician would be able to examine you throat, ears, skin, look at the real time, uh, at the EKG, uh, basically do everything they would otherwise do, uh, which is very familiar to them in their offices, except it would be done remotely with help of the on-site care coordinator, who also can help us um, socioeconomic determinants since that person is on site by the patient side. Uh, Zephi platform is uh, generally uh, enabled with all of the features of enterprise platform. They have dispatching algorithm, they have operational dashboard, uh, we have multi-tenancy capacity uh, on our platform, we have clinical triage, but the purpose of the platform is to power up our practice as a service uh, model. Uh, as discussed, our ZIFI kit contains all the necessary equipment for the doctor to make conscientious diagnosis. It's otoscope, uh, ultrasound if needed uh, to replace palpation. We have thermometer, pulse oximeter, blood pressure monitor, 12-lead uh, uh, EKG, our proprietary camera. All of the equipment is professional grade uh, and high durability and high quality. 
Uh, the markets are very broad and I just, I'm just going to mention some of them like remote patient monitoring, like employee, uh, uh, employee wellness program, which is very popular these days because all employees are concerned with uh, the employees coming back to work in a safety uh, manner. Um, also, uh, physicians of our coverage service or for the hospital would be early discharge, uh, discharge patient home monitoring. Um, our tap, uh, our um, um, uh, market is about 60 plus billion dollars. This numbers um, uh, from pre-COVID time. So uh, as you all know, the numbers are on the rise and in the making. So I'm curious to see what the numbers would be, but at least it's a 60 plus billion dollar market and that's quite sizable. Uh, so uh, here's my favorite part of practice as a service, uh, which started as a showroom for our technology and then we realized became the best products we can offer. During COVID times, we partnered with um, a couple of uh, social service agencies in New York City to address the needs of most vulnerable groups like senior citizens, um, uh, disabled patients, uh, uh, people from uh, uh, socioeconomic disadvantaged uh, 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 communities that did not have access to their regular providers, that did not have much access to technology. And uh, this COVID uh, experience proved that our technology is very much needed. While the hospitals were sort of a frontline defense addressing the needs of COVID patients, we were there to help most vulnerable ones, keeping them safe at home without the need to go to overcrowded places. And quite truthfully, we also sort of relieved the uh, um, uh, frontline workers in the emergency rooms who were overwhelmed with the number of um, uh, COVID patients. Um, so, uh, throughout the time, we had different, um, uh, we tried different applications for our technology, and this slide shows deployment of our toolbox to rural areas of Ghana, where there is a significant shortage of physicians. Uh, and with help of our technology, they were able to connect to Philadelphia-based uh, physicians to actually get the highest quality of care uh, uh, where they were uh, in in a matter of seconds. Um, uh, that's it in uh, four and a half minutes, I believe, of time, and uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to get into the investor feedback. We've got about eight minutes left to get some investor feedback. I've got one or two questions from the audience, and then we are going to launch the Startup Choice Award winners poll. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, and we'll get right into the investor feedback, starting with Dean. Great, thanks so much. And um, thanks for everything you've been doing, particularly with respect to those vulnerable populations in New York. Um, similar to the first presentation, I like to kick things off by just hearing a little bit about you, your background, and what motivated you to start the, the company. So I bring my uh, healthcare uh, provider experience to uh, to the table. I've been in organized health healthcare for over two decades in different capacities from leadership of professional organization organizations to um, quality control uh, committees uh, for one of the largest uh, third party payer. Uh, I'm also uh, heavily uh, vested in uh, philanthropy world and uh, just sit on executive boards of a couple of nonprofits, co-founded a couple of nonprofits. And uh, to summarize my professional and philanthropic interest, there would be around access to healthcare in general and uh, innovative programs for people with disabilities in specific. And I guess I just, Feel there was a need to, uh, for a change in healthcare delivery, and uh, uh, through partnership with uh, some of the most talented team members, as you could see on our team slide, um, I was completely sold on them uh, on this idea, and here I am. Got it. Um, in terms of patient demographics, I know you spoke about uh, seniors um, as one of the vulnerable populations. On your website, I saw an illustrated story of two moms talking about their kids being sick after a play date. I'm curious, um, I mean, maybe now and where do you envision focusing on what, what patient demographic um, with the business? So our patient demographic is very broad. Uh, it's, uh, well, we started as an alternative to urgent care uh, or after hours uh, urgent care um, visit. Uh, and this is where the moms and kids are very, um, uh, very much in line. And, and it's still needed for uh, young professional families who have multiple children and who it, it's, a, it's a challenge for them uh, after hours to find the provider and to get to the emergency room and they can use us alternatively. As I said, uh, as we developed our practice as a service model, we realized that there is even more need for our solution 
for uh, this other uh, uh, layers of bad, bad bond patients for seniors for socioeconomically disadvantaged disabled like for example one of the patients we saw through our pilot the social service agencies was 39 year old nonverbal autistic young adult and he was in the hospital for seven months because they could not figure out the discharge uh, a solution for him finally he was discharged on march 1st and his follow-up appointment with the, with the physician was uh, in mid-april obviously the appointment with the physician was cancelled so he was almost for two months he was without care and without understanding on what the next step for him we were able to address his problems we were able to connect his social worker with the physician and uh, the, for the team to decide what the, what the plan would be. And also uh, by bringing the at-home blood testing, we're able to organize for him sort of a hospital at home. So as I said, some of the scenarios that were not as obvious before COVID because there was much more uh, uh, available options for uh, healthcare, uh, to get healthcare uh, advice, uh, COVID times has shifted us to a little uh, to this other directions and showed uh, where our technology, it, it, for, for, while for young moms, we are a good solution, for these patients, we are the only solution. And I think that's what matters to me as a healthcare provider and uh, given my philanthropic background. Do you have plans to extend outside of New York City? Absolutely, absolutely. We are practice as a service. So we can uh, help with our technology to any healthcare institution nationwide. We actually have some uh, MOU with Canadian entities. Our health head of strategic partnership is uh, working on a municipal level with Canadian government, and they want to implement us as a solution for indigenous communities in British Columbia. So our technology is ready. We are ready to help with our technology to any healthcare entity that would be interested in expanding the reach and uh, connecting to their patients in a much uh, more efficient uh, uh, way. Thanks and also so. to utilize their healthcare providers in a much more efficient way. All right, excellent. Sandra? So very, very interesting. I, one of the questions is kind of tied to what Dean was talking about with regard to kind of expanding out. Uh, when you talk about uh, practice as a service, what is the business model? So I'm always kind of like in a mind of a hub and spoke kind of situation where are you thinking that you'll create uh, entities within different regions, different states, where you're going to expand technically, the, at least the technology, and I'll call it the suitcase for lack of a better word, leveraging the technology to get out there um, and, and really provide that care. And in addition to that, just as a follow-up, so um, you know, plan for expansion, what's the business model to expand? And then also, I'm very interested in who at the, at the end of the uh, of the day is actually using the device or, or getting the readings uh, using the technology in the in the suitcase with the patient uh, what kind of is it a clinician what level of uh, uh, skill set uh, is required yeah. so the beauty uh, of our model and that's what actually sets a good uh, start for uh, a good stage for uh, scalability is that uh, the person who is uh, by the patient side is minimally skilled it could be a medical assistant unless you have a nurse that's already by the patient side. But the person who, and, and the reason it's uh, possible is because the doctor, the highest uh, um, uh, link in a chain uh, of uh, hierarchy of um, uh, medical providers is always in during the exam and it, everything is done under doctor's supervision. So um, as far as the question about who is reading, it's the doctor. The doctor is examining patients. The doctor is making a diagnosis. The person on site is only helping with navigating the technology under doctor's uh, uh, advice. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, your other question, so we are very modular. So for example, uh, during COVID times and the temporary uh, um, uh, extra sites in New York City, uh, our toolboxes could have been used just by uh, just independently without uh, the software implementation. However, if you talk about practice as a service, not not necessarily we are going to be running that practice as a service. What we have right now, we have the whole protocol of onboarding of the minimal requirements as far as. Uh, uh, prerequisites for, for different uh, staff uh, to, to run this practice uh, to uh, all the protocols, infection, uh, pro uh, infection control protocols, training protocols. So we have all the know-how that we can use to help our potential institutional clients to set up this practice as a service if necessary uh, based on their uh, um, 
on the entity. And what kind of pricing do you see for that? It's almost like a, I don't wanna say franchise, we call that the F, the real F word franchise. Um, but the, the, the model that you're thinking in that um, mindset. So let's say you're working with a, a group of um, uh, five large practices, you wanna be able to provide this as a service out to uh, community uh, members, either in nursing homes or what have you. Correct, what, that would be one of the greatest applications for it. What is, what are, what am I buying? How much is it costing? You know, what's that business model? Well, of course, uh, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me that uh, anything of this uh, nature would depend on the, uh, um, on the scale of uh, whether you need just one toolbox for one provider or whether you're talking about thousands of providers. So obviously the pricing is going to be different and I'm happy to take it offline and discuss it further. I actually uh, would uh, love uh, the opportunity to do so with you. But uh, in, generally, the, in general, the cost of the toolbox is uh, around 15K and uh, the uh, cost per provider, if you're talking about retail price, for the software component is around $450 on a monthly basis. And of course, all of it varies based on what's the patient capacity that you need to serve per month because, uh, it, because our hosting um, capability changes. So, uh, but, but those are just basic numbers. They're very affordable as a healthcare provider. I can attest that uh, our technology is uh, very affordable and very reasonable priced. That's it. I hope, that, I hope this answered your question in 30 seconds. And I know it's, it's a very long answer. And I know we had 101 PM. So I would love to take it offline and discuss it further. Thank talk, you. To talk about, you know, changing the entire healthcare landscape in five minutes. So maybe, maybe that's why. Um, but I'm going to push, push it over to Mark for his, his question um, or any feedback. And then we'll quickly wrap it up here. I'm going to share the, the winner of the Audience Choice Award. And hopefully it will only be a few minutes over. Thanks for everyone sticking along to find out. Who wins? <laughs> and, and, and I'll be brief. I know we are, are tight on time here, but thank you. Very, very nice presentation. And, and again, you know, uh, really in an important space. So providing good care in a real important area. So thank you for that. And, and actually, I think um, Sandra's comments sort of interested me the, the whole business model, I could, because you can grow this yourself. But yeah, you could franchise it, I suppose, or, or sell, sell the kits. Do you have any IP around the uh, around the device? Absolutely, uh, yeah. We have uh, five patents. Anything from utility to design patents. Uh, our uh, design of the toolbox, for example, is part of the camera is fully patented. So yes, we do have an IP behind us. Okay, uh, great. I, I, I think you've got a lot of options going forward. Just have you have you raised money? Do you intend to raise money for the business? So we went so positive friends and family and raised around uh, 750K and uh, we are looking to raise a seed around uh, roughly around 1.5 mils to expand sales and operations. Great, terrific, very nice, very well done. Uh, Jasmine, enough for me. Mark, you know, I could, I could hear you do this forever. It's, I appreciate you keeping it short. Um, and I know that, you know, I'm sure any of these companies would be, would be happy to talk further offline. I want to thank the, the investors in the audience. There were a couple that have already requested slide decks and intros to each of the companies here and wanted to learn more already. So beyond the three of you, there, there are also some other investors pitching in and, and, and slacking me in the, in the comments. I want to thank everyone, Frank, Ebony, Ashley, everyone who was tuning in, commenting, asking questions uh, for today's episode. And I want to thank each of you again for, for taking the time out of your, your day and participating and, and helping to raise a little bit of awareness about some innovations that are, that are coming out in health tech. Um, without further ado, I'm going to ask everyone to do me a favor and quickly smile for me. My colleague Anna is gonna take a screenshot for social media. So on the count of three, one, two, three. Beautiful, all right. Well, last thing I'll say is that it was a extremely, extremely close, close race, but Jennifer at Navamize was the winner of the Audience Choice Award. So congratulations, Jennifer. Oh, Rada, thank Jan. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for participating. Again, if anyone is interested in connecting with these companies, my email is jasmine at techunited.co. I'm happy to get folks introduced. Dean, Mark, and Sandra are, again, thank you so much for, for coming, for sharing your feedback and being a part of our, our community. And on that note, I wish everyone a great rest of their week. 
and we'll see you soon. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.